Welcome to the Human Evolution Podcast, where we dive deep into the science, philosophies, and strategies that create real and lasting change. I'm Ori Goldstein, and here we leave traditional self-help behind and map the real terrain of true personal development. Today, Ori is talking with Brittany Carpenter. Brittany is a functional medicine dietitian and owner of Team Dietitian Brittany, a functional nutrition practice that specializes in gut and hormone health for women. Her team helps women find answers that they've been missing for decades so they can finally heal and get back to living. For starters, I'd really love to hear like, what the heck got you into the functional medicine. Like, it's, I know that I'm starting with asking the question, but like, it's just, it's, it, it fascinates me what you do. Yeah. Talk about poop all day. It's, it's like, I'm living the dream, you know? Uh, but really, honestly, we'll probably talk about your poop at some point today. So, uh, no, what got me into it. So I, you know, I've been a dietitian for over a decade and I worked in traditional medicine and just like saw that the problems, right. And it wasn't that people didn't care. It was that they the whole system doesn't work for getting people well right? It's a sick model. It's a sick care model, not a health model. And so I kept seeing like these poor patients are just miserable, right? And they're not, they're getting Band-Aid approaches and they're getting pills and they're getting handouts with nutrition recommendations that they're never going to read and that aren't applicable to them. And I'm just like, there has to be a different way, right? So um, I got my master's in human nutrition and functional medicine and uh, didn't have any plans to actually do anything on my own. And then I don't know, there's the universe like, Hey, you know, start posting on Instagram during maternity leave with my second baby and people just resonated with the message. And so I was like, okay, here we go. We're going to keep talking about poop and periods and functional medicine. And, you know, it just kind of went from there and it's turned into something that I just literally never imagined for my life. Right. Being able to connect with even you, you two, right? Like what world would we have ever connected <laughs> Like how cool, right? That, that yeah. the internet can kind of bring us together. It seems like the first time in history, really, where we finally have people starting to talk about solutions rather than problems. I mean, like you're talking yeah. about like all of history, doctors, people go to doctor and they'd say, you know what, like we've got to put leeches on you because you've got some kind of demon inside of you. For the first time, mm -hmm. like, I mean, Lee and I have spoken a lot about Joe Dispenza and stuff like that, that you finally get a chance to think about who it is that I want to be when I grow up kind of thing. And, and instead of like, what's wrong with me and how do I have to fix it in terms of who is it I want to be and how do I actually become that person? I love yeah. that you're actually doing that kind of stuff. You know, what's really ironic about what you just said. Literally my like theme of my life is I'm always like, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Right. Like I <laughs> age, you know, every year and I'm always like, I don't know what I want to do. Like, you know, I've done all of these things and I've had all of these jobs as a dietitian it's kind of like a local joke among like local dietitians. They're like, oh, Brittany's going to move on a couple, you know, it's been two years. She's going to get a different job. And it's just like, I just am multi-passionate, right? I just see something that feels so aligned. And then I'm like, well, how can I not go do that thing when it's like literally on my doorstep, right? I'm guessing that's why your audience like absolutely gravitated towards you. Like, I mean, every single person that comes in because they're doing a job, you'll feel it. When a person comes in doing their yeah. passion. It's a completely different thing. And I just love the fact, like, I mean, who knows where any of us will be in five years time, right? But like, I just yeah. love that concept that you're completely going towards your passion. Yeah. And that changes all the time. I mean, like Lee and I have conversations constantly about like, maybe we want to do this or like, I'm going to scrap everything and we're going to completely pivot. <laughs> and it's like, he probably hmm. hates me, honestly, as a client, because I just am like this, no, that remember that whole thing we did that we worked hours on, like, we're going to actually do something different. And I think, um, I don't know, it's just how my mind works. Right. And I think that the audience, you know, my clients benefit from that as well. It's exciting to change things and switch things up all the time. And, um, I don't think, I think that, you know, the three of us here are, aren't married to anything specifically. I, in Ori, I know like being on your team as well, this is working. This is not, let's get rid of this. Let's try something new. And I also think that all three of us, even though we set out to do certain things, I've had 10 jobs. Brittany and I were talking about this recently because she's looking to expand and kind of move up out of certain things and, and keep the brand and keep everything she's doing, but uh, ha at a higher level. Uh, very similar to what you're doing, Ori, with the coaching and everything else, uh, helping people with a broader sense of things instead of just being this is the one thing that that we all do, and it, which is great because we're all trying to do it at the same time. It doesn't mean it's going to work. I may still be in this basement a year from now with a shower curtain behind me, but <laughs> with any luck, we'll be on a trip somewhere. But yeah, we were just talking about mindset the other day, as a matter of fact, and there's a lot of overlap. Some of the things we discussed the other day uh, on Brittany's show were the um, 
the people being hypnotized by their parents about, you know, like, I am not a dieter. I am not a runner. I think you should tell it, Ori, the story about your client that overheard her mom say something, which drives straight to the heart of that. Absolutely. It's, I mean, it's a, this was actually on my first podcast with Lee when I told the story. And like, so it's, I mean, the basic bread and butter of a hypnotist when they get started is the idea of doing weight loss. So I started working off at a weight loss clinic and it's usually when a person comes to a weight loss clinic, sees a hypnotist, they've tried everything else in the world and nothing tended to work for them. And so this one woman came into my clinic. She was a good like 350, 400 pounds, like really overweight. She comes, sits down in the chair, sweetest woman on the face of the planet. And I start talking to her, you know, like, I mean, what is it that we can do for you? What's been, what's been your problem, et cetera. And she starts telling me about the fact of, you know what, like I've tried everything. I did Weight Watchers. It didn't work. I fit for, I did uh, Fit for Life. It didn't work. I did this. It didn't work. And every single time she's like, you know what, like, but I didn't really expect it to work. You know what? I'm fat. That's just what happens, you know? And she just keeps telling me all these stories, you know, like Weight Watchers, but like the diet, I, I was on it for six months, but then like, you know what? I was a fatty. I went up to a buffet and I ate too much. And she makes kind of like a joke out of it as just tends mm -hmm. to happen. But I realized that she just kept saying, you know, I'm fat, I'm fat, I'm fat, I'm fat, I'm fat. And so what we said was, like I said, like, let's instead of focusing on portion control or anything else, let's see where that comes from. So I did hypnosis with her and we went into something in hypnosis that you're probably familiar with called regression, where you take a person back to the first uh, situation that caused a problem. So I do regression with her and usually, unfortunately, you end up going back to something pretty traumatic, whatever it is. And I, and I, tell, and I tell her, I want you to focus in on the, the thought that you're fat, knowing that you're fat. It's a fact for you. Go back to where it all started for you. And she goes back. I don't remember to what age, six, seven, eight years old, whatever it is. And she's in the garden and she's playing with her sisters and her neighbors and her, and her cousins, whatever it is, playing with a hose in a bathing suit, having the time of her life. And they're just having fun. I'm like, okay, fine. And now what happens next? She's like, we're just playing around. We're running around. I'm like, okay. And what happens next? I'm kind of like waiting for the trauma to happen. You know, the car comes, hits my <laughs> sister or something, you know? And like, and I go, and what happens next? And she goes, well, I just hear my mom talking to the girl next to her. And she says, Nicole's going to grow up and be fat, just like me. Uh... And it's the craziest thing in the world. It wasn't someone getting hit by a car. It wasn't a molestation. It wasn't anything else. The fact of the matter is when we're young, like up until the age of like seven, but for a lot of us, sometimes quite a bit later, our parents to us are our psychics. They are our superheroes. When they say something, it isn't one of those things that just comes across as just like a thought. It comes across as a, a given fact. So when she hears mom say, Nicole is going to grow up and be fat, just like me, it wasn't just something that, that was just a passing comment to her. That was a psychic prediction. Mom knows I'm going to be fat. Now I know it too. And from that point forth, every single diet she went on in the back of her mind, she's got that little voice in the back of her head saying, yeah, I, I'll go on the diet because yeah, I, I want to lose the weight, but mom already told me what's going to happen. And yeah. to me, it's just the most amazing thing that like just one statement like that can completely change a person's life. And it doesn't need to be anything big, but once you're in that hypnosis, that hypnosis sticks. I literally was on a call yesterday with a client and it was a similar story, but we don't go as deep, like as to what you do in sessions, Very different. but you know, it, your past is what makes you who you are today, right? All of the scenarios and the situations you've been in are exactly what shapes how you're showing up in your life and how you're showing up around food and the people and all the things. And so this particular client, um, when we first started, I specifically pulled out this quote that she said about herself and she, cause I said, what's your level of commitment on a scale of one to 10? And she said, I would like to say, or I can't remember what she rated it, maybe a five. And she said, I would like to rate it higher, but I know that I failed so many times that I'm not, I don't have high hopes. And I'm like, okay, well already off the bat, we're like, where are we going to go from here? If you think you're not going to succeed, you're not going to succeed. So we had so many conversations because she is like showing up for herself in the last month. And I'm so proud Amen. of her. I literally got teary eyed because I'm just a crier. I cry all the time with my clients because I'm just so damn proud of them. Right. When you see them, I'm like a proud little mama, but when they're just showing up for themselves I and I specifically, passion, okay, so I'll probably cry on this call. So anyway, I pulled out that quote and I said, I want you like, this is what you said about yourself. Do you think that's true? And she's like, yeah, I think it's true. And so I start talking to her about like, all of the things that she's accomplished. And it's a really hard time in her life. She had a really traumatic event happen with her husband, yet she was showing up for herself in so many ways. And I was like, okay, objectively, let's look at this. Without the story you've always told yourself, like if you look at this about your neighbor, say this was about me and I told you this story about what I've been doing, is that a failure? 
And she was like, no, it sounds like you're doing great. And I was like, exactly. Like, you you know, and it's just undoing that story. Like one of my favorite phrases is what's the story that you're telling yourself? And is that true? And it's like when you dig deep, it's like, no, we're telling ourselves all of these. And I do the same thing, right? I constantly have to check myself. And, um, you know, when you get down to it, it's like, is that true about what I'm telling myself? It's no, it's not. It's just the story that you've made up. And so, again, parallels definitely. And yeah. we don't go as deep, yeah. but we definitely pull those things out as well. You're married. I'm in a committed relationship. I got to tell you, I love you. <laughs> I told her and, she should. Uh, she needs to sell her likeness to the AI uh, girlfriend company. She'll make a ton mm, of money. Hell I yeah! I mean, and, well, and there's always OnlyFans too, but we'll start with AI. I know. First. I know. <laughs> funny enough, so here's a funny story. OnlyFans reached out. Gosh, it's been months ago now, reached and they're like out? trying to. They're trying to move into the, like the business sector, so they're trying to be like Instagram, but for like. So it's anyway. They're trying to have like a paywall, but it's business. And I was mm. like, I don't think I'm going to sell that, right? Like when someone's coming, I'm like, I'll follow Join you on OnlyFans. Only I'm not passionate about it yet. Maybe one day mm. I will be. Um, <laughs> but Ori, it's funny you said that. I was going to ask if you had any kids. Uh, no, no kids. It's uh, in a committed relationship. It's, in, it's I mean, we're, like the way I like to say it is I'm actually too selfish to have kids at this point. I just hey, I'm I absolutely it. in love with my life. It's like we're having yeah. a great time and discussing at some it. point in time, maybe getting a puppy. I love yeah. it. Hey, that's a commitment too. I was going to ask because me and my husband spend so many hours thinking about kind of what you mentioned before, like we'll say something and then we replay it in our heads and we're like, dear God, why did we say that? She's going to be messed up for life. Like we think, t I want to say too deeply and maybe it's just the right amount of depth about the words we're using and the phrasing, you know, because as a parent, it's like, man, sometimes you're so heightened and it's not their fault that you can't control your emotions, right? Like we're trying so hard to to do it, but it's like, man, kids push your buttons, right? But then we'll say things and we like think about it literally all day and then we call each other at work and we're like, okay, so we just said that next time we, you know, we can't say things like that. And it's like, oh, so let me ask you a question damage. about that. So let yeah. me ask you a question about that. Because like, I mean, first and foremost, like my, fa my favorite saying is we're born, we're born perfect. And then we meet our parents. Like there's no <laughs> such thing as yeah. getting out of childhood, <laughs> not messed up on some level. But like the question I have for you is like, I mean, it's, are you, com and it's a tough question to ask, but like, Ooh. are you radically honest with your children in terms of like, after the fact, like if you mess up, there's nothing wrong with that. It's like, don't mm -hmm. expect yourself to be perfect. But like at the end of the day to go like cuddle up with your daughter or whatever it is and just be like, you know what? Like it's, I want to talk to you about what we said earlier. And I'm actually mm -hmm. kind of ashamed of the way I said that to you because that's not my truth. And yeah. that can so heal a relationship on such a deep level. Like to take it back to the Nicole story, like imagine at the end of the day, the mother like realizes that Nicole is like feeling bad or whatever it is. And she goes like snuggles up with Nicole in bed and goes like, you know what? Mommy was talking to her friend earlier when you were playing. And like, as I'm thinking about it, like I said these things and it's not fair to say about you. That's yeah. not true. That would have completely changed this woman's life in a three minute conversation. So yeah. the fact of the matter is we don't really damage our kids. The thing that we end up doing is we don't end up fixing what we damaged in the first place, which is the thing that really mm -hmm. gets to me sometimes. Yeah. No, we are fans of apology. I mean, growing up, I hopefully my mom doesn't watch this. Uh, we just were never <laughs> apologized to, right? Like I never can remember any time in which my parents apologized. Now, I, they were great parents too, right? But like there are things that you carry. Every person carries something from their childhood, right? And so that's a big sticking point for my husband and I is like, no, when we mess up, we apologize. And I'll apologize like right after because I'll raise my voice sometimes and I'm a pretty calm person. But like, again, it's like I get very overstimulated. I have a six-year-old and an almost three-year-old. Um, and so, and then running two businesses, right? It's just so much going on up here, but we absolutely will apologize. And it's so interesting when you see like, I'll apologize. Sometimes we'll wait if it's like really, you know, she's really upset and we'll just give it some space. But sometimes I'll try to do it in the moment if my oldest specifically is just really sensitive. And so if she like can't get out, if she's just can't get out of that headspace of upset, I'll go in. And it's so interesting because you walk in the room and there's that guard. You can feel it even as a six-year-old that there's this guard up and there's, you know, anger and there's all of these things. And then the second I start saying, hey, 
you know, my, I'm going to cry. I can, yeah. oh my gosh, where are my tears? <laughs> anyway, we're just doing the best we can and that's all we can do, I, you know? I love the fact that you're willing to be strong enough to be that vulnerable with your children. Like, I mean, like it's, it's just, it's, this is something that never, like one of my family's favorite stories is like the one time we we're taking a road trip and my brother was always just like the... He was basically Satan. And so he was sitting in the back seat and he was like <laughs> causing all the problems. And all three of us are sitting in the back seat, my brother, my sister, and I. And my brother's creating all this havoc. And so my father, like, he's just so annoyed at some point in time. He just he doesn't know what to do. So he reaches behind him to slap my brother to tell him to shut up. He misses my brother, slaps my sister, and my sister <sighs> packs out crying. And so, like, my father, like, he just slapped my brother, he gave him a good slap, his ready, his like his proud of himself for doing it. And he hears my sister crying. He's like, What are you crying about? And she goes, You slapped me. So like in that moment, my father did the only thing that was logical in that moment. He goes, you probably deserved it too. Yeah. It's like, so I just love the fact that like, you're actually willing to be that vulnerable with your children and be like, you know what? Mom messed up. Like that yeah. is the difference that makes a huge difference. Well, and it was very uncomfortable. Like we didn't have, we weren't like touchy feely. Like I was always shown love, but we weren't, we didn't have real conversations. We didn't, you know, do those things. And so showing up in that way is so hard in the beginning, you're just like cringing the whole way through. Like, do I have to? And then it's just easier, right? The more, it's just like with anything, the more you do it, the more comfortable you are and the more it becomes a part of like who you are. Right. Um, and I even carry that in so, business. I'm sure you see that too, of like, sometimes I mess up, right. Or sometimes something came across wrong and I'm not going to put a guard up and defend what happened. You know, I'm going to explore that with you and talk about my intentions and, you know, how I'm still learning and growing. And I think that's what makes a good practitioner in every sense of the word, right? It's just knowing that you're going to mess up and you're not going to know everything. And it's a hard place to be too. And, and the thing I'm actually curious about is like with your clients, because I mean, this is obviously a stuff I deal with on a daily basis, but with your clients that come in with whatever it is, IBS or like some kind of like chronic gut issue, whatever it is, You've got to train them to become a brand new person that all of a sudden mm -hmm. doesn't have all this fear, doesn't have all these anxieties mm -hmm. or worries that they keep on up in their stomach. And I'm sure that's the exact same thing for them. Like they're just, you've got to train them literally to mm -hmm. become a different person, right? Yeah. And I can tell you the, so talk about like bacterial overgrowth and things that we can, you know, if there's something that we are fixing with diet, nutrition, supplements of some kind, that's the easy stuff. The hardest clients that the ones that we just cannot get the needle to move on sometimes are the ones that will not take a closer look at their life and say, can I show up differently? Like what are some big radical changes Amen. that I need in order to heal and to be healthy? And the ones that aren't willing to look at that, they're just like a victim of the situation that they're in right is they they will i'm not positive they'll ever find healing which i don't like as a practitioner well then it looks like i didn't do my job but like this is a wall that we cannot get past if you can't address what's going on up here which is affecting everything down here there's only so much i can do right but it's wild because i could literally tell them like hey listen i think what's going to heal you is if you just like ate poop for the rest of your life right they'd be like cool let's do it but you ask them to like manage stress set boundaries, <laughs> explore past traumas. They're like, yeah, I didn't sign up for that. You know, like anything else, ask me to do anything else and I'll do it. And it's just hard as a practitioner to, to get them to that space, right? If they've never had the mind, you know, it's like you need to be exposed to some of these principles in order to realize that it's helpful. Otherwise on the outside looking in, you're like, what could that possibly have to do with anything? Right. How is setting a boundary going to heal my gut? And it's like, man, it's just all connected. I I'm guessing you didn't tell you the story or anything else, but for me, like about like 13 or so years ago, I messed up my back and here I am a hypnotist for like over 20 years, knowing like working with people for back pain, constantly having people in my office and helping them with back pain. I hurt my back. I go, I get the MRI and they go, yes, so you have a, a ruptured disc L5S1. And I'm straight away going, and so everyone's still like, did you hypnotize yourself? I'm like, no, I have a real issue. It's, it's like, it's not it's one of those real... fake issues like my client have. Like, I've got the real thing. Like, I've got, I've got the rupture. It's like, and it's just so funny because like, I mean, it's, I spent, and I, I told you about this, like I spent a good like six figures on trying to heal my back and I never moved the needle until I mm. finally actually went into the amount of anxiety I had inside of myself, the amount mm. of things I had stuck inside of myself that created the, the person that could have the back pain in the first place. And then all of a sudden needles started moving in a huge, huge, huge way. It's like, and, and the thing that gets to me the most is like, I'm the person that should definitely know better. 
But like, no, I got the real issue. It's I don't have one of those fake things. Like, and yeah. it drives me nuts to think that I was that stupid about it all. What's well, like they say a therapist needs a therapist, so like a dietitian needs a dietitian. So I'm like the worst at hydrating myself, even though I have like two beverages. I so I like need a dietitian to coach me. So if I'm really struggling, I'll like message my team and be like, all right. Somebody coach me into drinking more water, like make it happen, right? <laughs> I know all the strategy, right? I can make it happen. I just like don't. What's the block? I don't know. Maybe it's a childhood trauma. So yeah. it's refreshing too, like with both of you, especially with Ori, because when he, when I uh, record with Ori, a lot of it is we're addressing some of my issues. That's that's what kind of what what makes the show is he there's a work in progress. We can talk about all kinds of things, and we have breakthroughs almost every single time. Certain things in my life that I thought. <laughs> were due to something else we find out like it's completely different but one of the things i really appreciate about ori is he's he's living it now like he's been doing this for a long time and he knows like what needs to happen but he still you know is i don't want to say messes up but you still have stumbles you still have to go get things done you're always going and and you know getting your own therapy and everything else which is a wise way to go because it's super hard when you have all the answers to apply it to yourself. I actually want to share my screen because I think that this is actually something that's really helpful maybe for your, your uh, clients that will be watching this. So it's, I actually spoke to Lee about this a couple of podcasts ago about the levels of change when it comes to people. When a person comes to you for some kind of a change, they say that there's five different levels at which a person can change. And let's just go through it for a moment. So the first level of change is environment. So in environment, it's something like a person comes to you and you go, well, let's see if there's any kind of mold in your environment, if there's any kind of toxins, any kind of bad food in your fridge, stuff like that, that you basically need to really fix them on some environmental level and get them out of a bad environment. But now let's just say, for example, you get them out the bad environment, but their problem isn't the mold or toxins in their fridge. It's actually a behavior that they have. So they don't drink enough, they make bad food choices, they don't plan their meals, whatever it is. And at that point in time, regardless what environment they're in, they're still going to end up having these bad behaviors. So then you go ahead and you teach them about behaviors and you're like, okay, fine. So let's get you towards meal planning. Let's get you towards food choice. Let's, let's get you hydrating more. And so now you think you fixed them, but then what happens is what if their problem is something along the line of capability? So you get them into hydrating more, but what their problem is the fact that they've actually got some kind of uh, bacterial overgrowth, their capabilities, their body is not actually capable of doing the right things. So you then you work with them at the level of some kind of nutrition or whatever it is to change their capabilities, make them more capable to be able to take in the new behaviors and environment that you've changed for them. And so for me, like these are the things that more often than not, what I would call the mechanic tends to do as such, like it's changing, figuring out the person's environment, behavior, capabilities, and what can I change for them? But then it gets even deeper in terms of like, and this is stuff that I discussed with Lee in terms of beliefs and values. So what happens if a person comes in with a belief along the lines of um, dairy is dangerous or um, I, I'm not capable of healing or um, uh, whatever it can be along those lines. It's like it's a, um, uh, the world is a dangerous place. So what happens is even if you fix their bacterial overgrowth and everything else, they're never going to get over their anxieties or their or their strong safety orientation. And so regardless what it is you fix in terms of their behavior, capabilities, environment, everything, they're still going to be stuck in the same place because of their beliefs holding them there or the specific uh, emotions that they can't get rid of. And then finally, so like, let's say you finally work with them on their beliefs and you finally get them over the belief of uh, dairy is dangerous. But what happens if you get to a person and they've actually got the identity of I am broken? At which point in time, like, even if you're over, even if you deal with the concept of dairy, dairy is dangerous, as long as that person still keeps believing that they're sick or broken or that there's something wrong with them on some level, nothing is ever really going to fix them. It's, I just wanted to share this with, with you and your group because to me, it's, it's like that is the one thing that really makes a huge difference in terms of you can do all the mechanics on someone. You can really make the changes. But when you actually get to the point of looking at the beliefs or the identity is where you can actually start making the change with someone. And like I love the fact, I absolutely adore the fact that what you're talking about right now is that you're getting to that level because there's, I, I'm sure that there's a ton of dietitians out there. But the thing that's going to make a difference is when you actually help the person understand the fact that they they are winning in life, that they are actually doing the right things and that they aren't that broken person is when you can actually make that shift for them. Yeah, I love it. What other slides do you have? 
<laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It was great. Yeah, you, you're spot on. I mean, and again, it's like they want, but people want the mechanics. They want the stool test. They want to see that's overgrown. How are we going to kill it? This is off. What are we going to do about it? Right. And it's like, how do you get that whole perspective shift of like waking up as like, no, you're just this. I hate to say waking up as a new person, but you know what I'm saying? Like you wake up saying, I am somebody who walks in the morning. So what are you going to do? You're going to walk in the morning. If you believe that about yourself, that you are somebody who walks in the morning, it's going to be much easier to walk in the morning, right? Than if you wake up and you're somebody who doesn't exercise in the morning, how likely are you going to put on your shoes and go outside? It's not even going to be a thought in your head because you're just somebody who doesn't. Yeah. Right. And the thing is, like you said, like you can get a person to eat their poop kind of thing. But like when you tell them to start walking in the morning, they're like, wait a second. Like that actually sounds like a lot of work here all of a sudden, you know? Yeah. Now it sounds kind of sketch. Yeah. I don't think I'm into that. <laughs> I think I'm going to find a new it, practitioner. But yeah, I mean, it's just a whole interesting, it takes an entire shift of like the culture even, right? Because even the traditional model, like the model of disease is there's something wrong here, and you fix it with a pill or you fix it with this. And it's like some people have just never been introduced to the idea that that might be wrong or that there might be something else, right? And that's what we see with functional medicine. And you're on a completely other level of that, right? Of like you see, okay, I have high cholesterol. I have to take this pill or else I will have high cholesterol. And I say, well, no, we need to figure out why you have high cholesterol in the first place. It's Amen. not because you're eating too much saturated fat, right? Like what is it about your body that's causing the inflammation in your arteries that's causing the blockages? It's such a deeper issue. And so I'm over here being like, hey, there's another world in which you can live without pills. And then the next step, I almost see it as like, levels in my mind. And the next step is like, okay, because you do have to have the nutrition piece too. You have to be supporting your body. And then also you need to be nourishing your mind and shifting things so that you really believe you are somebody who can feel good. You're somebody who can have energy, who can not blow up at their kids when they don't pick something up, you know? And it's like, it's such a quality of life issue. And I think sometimes with gut issues, if you've never experienced gut, gut issues, it's easy to be like, so what? You poop once a week. Cool. Right? Or so what? You're bloated. You look fine. You're small. Right? Like I'm a very small person. I'm five foot, like oh, 115 or something, you know, somewhere around there. Right? So I'm just small. I'm like fun size. Uh, and so, <laughs> you know, when I had really severe bloating, nobody had pity on me because they're like, you're so small. Right? And I am. I'm in a small body. Right? But it's like, no, that's not the issue. The issue is quality of life. It's all the symptoms that came with it. I don't care if my stomach looks big or it doesn't. What I care about is that I can't take a deep breath, that I develop anxiety and depression for the first time ever, that I have random acne. I've never had, even as a teenager, I didn't have acne. Right? So it's like, it's a quality of life thing. And we make it about the thing, the bloating, the constipation, the diarrhea. And it's like, no, that's not at all what it's about. It's about, it's keeping you from living and showing up in your life the way that you want to show up. Right. And then what's the point? Why are we here It's to live the life that we want? And if something's keeping you from that, why are you waiting to pull the trigger? Why are you waiting to invest? You're literally wasting your life. And this is where I mentioned, I cry all the time, I think about my clients, but literally every time I talk about moms specifically, I just have a heart for moms when I became one of like, they grow up so fast, so fast. And you can like equate this Aww. to a dog, right? They grow up too. Uh, but it's like, it, it, it is a blur. Like when people say that it's a cliche for a reason. And if you cannot participate in their lives because of your health issues, nothing else matters. Like what in the world matters? You need a new car. Okay, cool. But what you need is to show up for your kids. You will never get that time back ever. And then you're going to look, see, now I'm getting all teary eyed because it's, I love it. it's just wild to me. Like what is worth more? Like there's nothing in the world that you could invest in that is going to give you the return that addressing your health will. What, like what what is that saying? Like the healthy man has a million wants, the sick man has but oh. one. Yeah, it's, it's so I true, just... right? And on the other side, you see that too. You see how people are healing and they're feeling better and they're living their damn life, right? And then you see the people on the other side who can't pull the trigger. And you're like, if you could just 
say yes, then your entire life will change. Like, let me help you change your life. But I have to have you say yes, right? And it's so hard. It's so hard. But I'm again, it's like, yeah, what what matters more than feeling good every day? Yeah. And, and I literally know what the psychology is behind that too, because we've talked about this before about how people are willing to spend a ton of money on like a new car or, mm -hmm. you know, like you Brittany, we were talking about like, like getting your tree removed in your yard. Like people are like, oh, $3, yeah, I need to have, yeah, four, four grand, yeah. whatever. But then you tell people, hey, it's going to be X amount of dollars for either therapy or nutrition plan or both. They're like, ooh, you know, I put that off. So, Ori, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I got plenty, plenty of thoughts about that, unfortunately. So, like, I mean, like, it's so to me, it really boils down to the concept of, and we spoke about it before. There's quite a few different concepts, but the one that really comes up in my mind first and foremost is a concept of secondary gain. You and I, Lee, have discussed that quite a bit. So imagine, for example, a person um, when they were growing up realized the fact that uh, by overeating, they feel safe. And so now you all of a sudden tell them, do you know what, in order to get you to be better or eating cookies makes them feel safe or sugar makes them feel safe. Now all of a sudden you tell them, you know what, we need you to get stop. We need you to stop eating sugar. But in the back of their mind, they're not giving up sugar. They're giving up safety. And mm -hmm. so in their mind, like you can tell them everything in the world you want, but like it's at the end of the day, until they learn to feel safe, they're never going to listen to you. There's zero chance in the world that they're ever going to get there. It's really understanding the fact that behind every single behavior lay a positive intention. It's like to take it back to the concept of you and, and getting annoyed with your kids. For example, say something bad to your kids for a moment. If you like go and talk to your kids and you go, you know what, mommy screamed, that doesn't really make much sense. But if you say, you know what, mommy screamed because she saw you walking towards the street and you were going to get hit by a car and that made mommy really scared, that makes perfect sense. If in that moment, if I were to be your hypnotist and I were to say, Brittany, don't scream, you're going to be like, shut the fuck up or <laughs> pardon my French. You're going <laughs> to be I'm like, I'm going to scream at you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so to me, the big thing, and like it's, and I mean, I'm obviously using quite large examples, but on every single level, a person learns to have a specific behavior to get a certain outcome. And until you can get that outcome met in a different way, the person is just going to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. It's, and, and the, the challenge is, it's when I deal with a person, for example, with um, smoking, which is still a very tough addiction, a person can mm -hmm. smoke or not smoke and it's over. That's it. When you deal with a person with food and eating, it's not something that person can just stop doing. You actually have to retrain yourself to actually eat the right foods at the right times. And you're always going to be in a restaurant and those other foods are always going to be there in front of you and you still have to make a choice of food. So it's that much harder until the person actually really gets to the depth of what it is that's really driving them. Yeah. Yeah. It's Brittany, so what true. was that thing the other day? Uh, you mm -hmm. were telling me, Brittany, about eating. I, I know I need to pay more attention when you talk. Oh, that's very but, uh, specifically. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But no, yeah. you had. <laughs> You had a really good point, though. Told yeah. me about eating. Yeah, <laughs> but it was very, it was very along the lines of, of uh, the thing, the things that Ori describes uh, about like mm -hmm. eating and like taking a bite. And uh, if you want to mm -hmm. get into that a little bit, for you and I have like a very similar, like we have very similar um, perspectives and like I different skill set. That. So we yeah. can just become, we can morph into a super being and we'll take over the world. And so that's the goal. And Lee, I guess you can come too. Uh, you can do our marketing. I'll be, <laughs> in, the I'm fine in the basement. I'll be, I'll yeah, be in the basement yeah. here doing stuff. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so I talk people through that too. It's like, okay, so you find yourself in the pantry for the third time that night. And then the hardest part for them, the hardest hurdle is getting them to pause. And when you can get them to pause, that then they can bring the mindfulness into the equation. And I have them ask, you know, a series of questions. Number one, what am I feeling right now? And that's a hard question for people to, to answer if they've never asked themselves, like, what am I actually feeling? So am I bored? Am I stressed? Am I seeking comfort? Like you mentioned, am I seeking connection? Am I anxious? Right? What is that? And then the question is, so maybe they're reaching for Oreos. We always use Oreos. Lee, do you talk about Oreos? Is that why I keep talking about them? I don't know. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm also thinking about them right now, so it's probably coming through the projection. Yeah, it came, it came yeah. through. So connected. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> okay, you're invited to be a super being with us. That's fine. So say I'm seeking comfort. I'm stressed. Let's go with stress because that's really common. I'm stressed. Are these Oreos going to fix that feeling of being stressed? You have to ask yourself, right? The answer is no. Sometimes, depending on what you're feeling, the answer might be yes, right? But in this scenario, it's a no. The Oreos are not going to help fix that feeling of stress that I'm feeling about my day tomorrow. Okay, so the next question is, what is going to help? 
What is going to help address the feeling that I'm feeling right now of stress? Okay, well, maybe I need to prepare a little bit more. Maybe I need a good night's sleep. Maybe I need to do something completely unrelated to take my mind off of it. And then that's the thing that you do. Because then that makes you, that's fixing, not fixing the emotion, right? But you're addressing what actually you're seeking in the moment in a way that is so much better. Because if you would have eaten the Oreo, now you're going to be more stressed because you're like, why the hell did I eat that Oreo? Like, what did I hit a whole sleeve of Oreos and I'm, I'm dumb. And then there's that whole narrative. I have poor willpower. This is what I do. I'm a self-sabotager, right? All of those things. And so when I can get my clients to do that, and honestly, they do so great with it. The hardest part, again, is just that pause and bringing mindfulness into it. But I'm telling you, it changes literally everything for them. We could not even talk about nutrition at all and just bring mindfulness into the picture and their entire life changes because you cannot mindfully eat an entire thing of Oreos. It doesn't happen, right? Because your enjoyment Amen. factor goes goes down, right? You have one Oreo. And even in the eating process, I think that's what Lee was kind of referring to is, okay, you have an Oreo. And after the first bite, you're like, okay, how is this taste? I got it so good, right? I forgot how good Oreos are. Do I want another bite? Yes, I absolutely do, right? So then you have another bite. And after every bite, you check in. Am I enjoying this? Because most of the time we're just eating on autopilot, right? And so when you actually ask, am I enjoying it? The real answer is by the third Oreo, you're just kind of like, yeah, I think I've had my fun, right? The first one was so good. The second one was delicious. The third, mm, I think I'm done, right? And then I, you can put, it, it. Yeah. put it down. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with, I always tell clients, there's no food that's off limits as long as you're bringing mindfulness into the picture, right? And you can have as many Oreos as you want, as long as you're thoroughly enjoying them and in control of that decision. And it doesn't happen. People don't eat endless Oreos when you're thinking about if you're enjoying it or not. I don't know if Lee told you, but like, I mean, like he said, our podcasts are very often me working on Lee. And so Lee bought up his drinking. And the one thing that I did with Lee was I said, he talks about going to a bar and just finding himself drinking. And I'm like, instead of just finding yourself drinking, stop being the victim to the situation and realize you're making a choice to drink. I don't yeah. care if you have 10 beers after that, but realize that this is a conscious choice you're making. And mm -hmm. to your point exactly, like to, the only difference between the kind of things that we say, but it's still the exact same thing, is for me, I hate the idea that a person sees themselves as a victim to the situation when they're not. The, the true definition of maturity to me is when a person becomes responsible for their decisions. And literally to me, responsibility is broken down as two separate words, response, ability, the ability to respond. So you go into a bar or you go into your pantry and you see the Oreos. In that moment, you see the Oreos and you choose how to respond to it. Do you know what? I'm going to eat them and I'm going to love them. That's great. At least it was a conscious choice as opposed to the Oreos. The bad decision fairy came up behind me, tapped me with a magic wand and made me make this decision. Lee can tell you, like, I mean, like, as I'm sure so many of your clients can, which is why it's so amazing that the moment you add in that, that step of mindfulness, as you say, that, that idea of being able to be in control of it you're no longer a victim in your story. You actually get yeah. to now start running your story. I love it so much. When I went from, um, this is how I unwind, this is what I deserve at the end of the day, this is something I do, this is something I've always done, because I have, I was always drinking every day after work, even if it was just a glass of wine or something, there was rarely a day where I didn't have some form of alcohol, and that went on for 25 years or so. But just recently when I was you know, working with Ori, he's like, if you want to drink, drink. He's like, I'm not going to tell you to stop drinking, but just make it your choice. And that really did shift everything for me. I'm like, like today, you know what? I'm going to drink today. And it's because I want to, you know, versus it's Friday. I'm supposed to be at happy hour or, you know, or Tuesday. It doesn't really matter what day of the week it was. It's or happy Monday, hour every day. Wednesday, Thursday. Or brunch yeah. on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Middle of yeah. the night when I can't sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that doesn't work. But yeah. Yeah. But so, but when, when I actually felt a little bit more power over myself or over the whole situation, like I'm choosing to do this or not, as simple as that, I'm like, okay, so now it's not that big of a deal. And the same thing that works for overeating. <laughs> this is what I'm going to eat. But it's also with portion control too, because I think, Brittany, we were talking about cheesecake the other day and it's like even as you're eating it just think about it you know, do i really need to clean my plate because we were all kind of taught uh clean your plate as you're you know growing up because yeah. food is scarce and everything else so it's really like something you know, about in africa the, and it's like i yeah, remember eating kid being like are we, what do yeah. you mean yeah <laughs> yeah dave chappelle yeah, something funny about the buddy was like um mm -hmm. well there's people starving in africa dave he's like 
I'm sure there are, but I'm hungry right now too. God damn it. You know, it's like <laughs> I need to eat too. They were talking about the cheesecake factory and, and just like the decision to either clean your plate or mm. like the, for throwing the food away. It's something that clients, you know, they'll bring that up. It's like, okay, well, I don't want to waste it because I've paid for it, right? I'm at a restaurant. I'm completely stuffed, but I don't want to waste it, right? And so something that I'll have them kind of reframe is your body doesn't need that food. So you're either wasting it in your body, as in it doesn't need it. It's going to store it. It's excess or you're going to waste it in the trash can and you've already paid for it. It's done. Right. And so, and also I'll have him reframe of like, you're paying for the experience, not the food. So we have like family date night once a week. And, um, that's the thing. Like kids don't eat food. Now we always bring home leftovers. Cause I'm like a leftover queen. I'm like, Oh, two French fries. Let's take it home. You know, like, let's keep it. They'll <laughs> eat it. Uh, that's not true. I won't bring those home. But anyway, uh, it's the same concept. It's like, no, I know that we're not paying for the itemized receipt that we get. We are paying for a night out of bonding and fun as a family. The girls get pizza. They're so excited, right? It's just a whole thing. Me and my husband can chat um, and just connect. And it's just that whole vibe is what you're paying for. And that reframes it too, because then if there's wasted food, you're like, well, we paid for the experience. I mean, it's when we first started this conversation, like, I mean, I've, I've been watching you on Instagram and I went on your website, but like, I didn't realize to what degree you actually work with people on a mental level. And I think it's yeah. amazing. It's funny, you know, we talked about, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up and uh, it's true, but my drive, you know, it was so gut health focused and I'm like, I just gut health, gut health, gut health. And now I'm like, man, what I really love to do is to shift mindset around food, right? All of the things that we're talking about is truly like where my passion is going. And so, but I'll be honest with you, that's hard to market. You try to get someone who wants to lose weight to shift mindset versus talking about nutrition specifics, it's like, that's a hard sell because they don't understand, right? But I'll tell There's you, that. I'll tell you from the other side, like, I mean, looking at that yeah. pyramid, the thing that you have that's going for you so beautifully is that you've got those first three levels covered. I don't mm -hmm. think it's only about shifting the mindset. I think you actually do really need to teach a certain person the mechanics. Like there's certain people that just really don't mm -hmm. have a clue why Oreos are bad for them, you know, or <laughs> like, is right. it really a bad thing? It's like, and when you throw in the mindset, you can actually really change the person as opposed to just make some kind of a menial shift. So yeah. like to me that you are coming across as a full package. I don't think mm -hmm. only sell the mindset because trust me from the point of view of someone that's only worked on mindset is I eventually have to send people to a person like you to learn the other side of it because they just never right. learned it. And I think that's, I think that's where it comes in too, of like we taking the burden off too. When I was really early in my practice, people would come to me with, so, I mean, they are complex. We get very complex clients. And at first I felt like I needed to do everything. I needed to know everything or even on Instagram, the amount of questions I get in a day. And I felt like I have to, I have to now research this. I have to become the expert because this person is relying on me to know the answer. And now I'll just be like, I don't know. I've not looked into it. Right. And it's so funny because in the beginning, I'm like, what is that? That I felt like I had to be everything. And it's like, you don't you, because there's no way you could be the expert on everything. And every client needs something slightly different. And so instead having people to refer to, because you're going to do it way better than even if I learned it. Right. Same thing with the nutrition piece. If you learned, I could teach you everything you needed to know about nutrition but I could probably do it better, right? Because that's what I've 100%. been doing. And so it's like just bringing that team approach in is so important too, because then you're giving the clients the best of the best versus I do this really good and I do this kind of mediocre, but I'm going to do it anyway. Like that doesn't really work either. So I think that I just love like people. I just love to be around <laughs> people. It's just like having that group. I just love to collaborate and what better time to collaborate than on patient care right? Like that's the time to collaborate. I love the fact that this is also going through to my group because I'm the same way. It's, I want everyone in my group. Like, I mean, regardless how much I talk to them about mindset, you can have the most perfect mind in a messed up body and it's just not going to get you anywhere. I can't tell yeah. you for how long, like for example, my hormones were just slightly out of whack. And regardless what I was thinking, I was just pulling myself into a spiral of depression by just my body wasn't functioning well. It wasn't digesting food, et cetera. And I just love the fact that people in my community will get a chance to actually hear the other side of things and actually also get a chance to integrate this into their lives. I think that that is a huge, huge thing. 
connection, the, the mind body connection, which is kind of becoming a bigger thing these days that the holistic view is just ridiculous. I mean, some of the stories that I've heard from Ori again, as somebody who's been practicing this for a long time, he went on the same silent retreat that I'm about to go on here. And some things came up for him that he'd completely <clears throat> forgotten about. And he actually had physical release from it, like physical release from something that happened to him. How old were you? Five years old or something like that? No, I mean, that's like fucking crazy. three months, like three oh, months shit. old. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, literally, like it's, it's too long a story to tell, but like, I mean, like it's just freaking crazy the way the body keeps the score and holds on yeah. to stuff. And like to bring that in towards your clients, it's like, it's just one of those things. And that, that if something happens to you when you're young and all of a sudden you have like this terrible like one of the things that happened for me, weirdly enough, was like when I was five years old, I have no clue why, but I had a terrible pain in my stomach the one day. And so it's a, in the middle of the night, my grandmother called the doctor, whatever it was. And I had this whole big thing happen for me in terms of pain in my stomach. And ever since then, I had digestion issues. But what it boiled down to was in the back of my mind, the body was keeping the score and there was a level of anxiety that my body was holding on to that I needed to release in order for those digestion issues to finally go away. It's like, and it's regardless what I did, regardless of probiotics I took, or regardless of everything else, actually needed to deal with that anxiety that was just being trapped inside the body. So Lee, what are you, what's going to come up for you? This is going to be so interesting. Your little know. three-month-old baby self. Mm, I don't know. I mean, it depends. We'll see. It may, it may hit national news. Depends. Yeah. If you see, if you see somebody with a red face streaking through Ann Arbor, Michigan, being chased by police helicopters, that'll be me because that's where the well, temple no. is. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to do. It's kind of, I'm kind of thrusting myself into it. Obviously, meditation super beneficial, and uh, you know, even taking a little bit here and there. One doesn't have to go on a a two week silent retreat, but I'm hoping to get some at least good content out of it, one way or another. But yeah, there's some stuff buried way back in there, and as Ori will tell you, um, some things don't come out until what day seven, eight, or nine. Or day 13, you come back home and you think everything is over and all of a sudden you have like this weird thought like, oh my God, mommy, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Please just this. film everything when you get your phone back so we can all examine what's going on. Oh my yeah. God, that would be awesome. Like Blair Witch style pro <laughs> kind of idea. Yeah. Look at this. This is happening now and I don't know why. Running from the cops. Yeah. <laughs> The, the idea is, is, to, is to film, I'll film something myself going in and then coming out, I'll, I'll uh, get my phone back and try to, I mean, just honestly, the, you know, that's funny. The most anxious part about this whole thing is like, I got to read like 3000 messages when I get out of all the things the I have emails, to do, I'm all packed up. Yeah. I got my, I got my special pillow I got on Amazon. Oh, I can sit on, uh, I'm more concerned about like how much shit am I going to have to sift through and dig out of so, when I'm out of that place. But. So this is just the hypnotist talking again, just to finish off our little thing. But like, it's, I really hope you deal with that in the retreat because there's obviously a part inside of you that's so afraid of letting people down that that's showing up. And I'm like, telling you, it gets me every time. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm also concerned that things are going to go to shit while I'm gone, which is probably not true. I just, uh, you know, and I want those things. It's like, it's, I, I mean, you talk about them as if they're like they're foregone conclusions, but like, this is your moment of mindfulness mm -hmm. to basically sit there saying like, is this a truth or is this just a story I'm telling myself? Like, it's like, mm. I'm not going down that path right now, but like, I mean, like it's, I want you to be aware of the fact that these are thoughts that you're carrying around your head the whole freaking time. And now this retreat is giving you the opportunity to finally look at them. Or am I worried that I'm going to become obsolete and nobody's going to need me when I come oh. out of there? Oh, shit. Anyway, that's a great place to end. Unlocked. What a great place to end. Uh, anyway, Ori, where can we find you? Other than OnlyFans, where can we find Ori Goldstein for the, for the list here? So it's obviously I've got my personal website, OriGoldstein.com. And uh, we've created a Facebook group that's completely free to join, has a lot of resources where we share a lot of things, uh, at humanevolutionmovement.com. And there you'll be able to get all the information, join the Facebook group, and find out a lot more about us. And Sounds obviously like YouTube. Yeah, and this will be going on both channels. Okay. So, Brittany, I, you know, you could plug yourself if you want to, but this is going on your channel. So, so just for anyone who doesn't follow, um, the best place to figure out what I'm all about is Instagram. You can see me poorly dancing and cooking up recipes and talking about poop. <laughs> so uh, if you don't follow me and you want all that, um, that's probably the best way um, to follow along. I have some other channels. I just try to streamline so I'm not completely tied to social media, as I'm sure you you get to, but, um, that is mm. probably the place. Mm -hmm. Well, you did hit a million views the other day, right? On something. Yes. So. Yeah. One um, million views. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. You know, what's really ironic. So when I first started, uh, I had a one video hit over a million 
And I haven't had that since until this video, but it wasn't really my, I was just like reacting to a video. So I can't even take credit for it really. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it was a great message to get out. Like I had one person comment, you know, there's always people that comment, right? And someone was like, what did you contribute to this video? And I was like, absolutely nothing, honestly. But the reach, <laughs> it reached a million people that it wouldn't have reached before. So like, did I add mm -hmm. to anything? No, I did not. But the awareness... Yeah. Or you added you know, to social consciousness. There we go. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they say what? Like most people have nice things to say. Just typically don't take the time to say something. The people that yeah. I was going to say the people that are sitting at home in their mom's basement, but I guess that's where I'm at now. But you know, those are the yeah. ones that make stupid fucking comments and whatever. So yeah. Anyway, it's well, interesting. It is not even near the worst comment I've ever had. So it's I was like, yeah, it's just calling me out. I love it. I need people to call me out too. You know. Yeah. Well, it's, it's engagement. It counts. It's good for the algorithm. But it counts. Yeah. Anyway, guys, to be continued. This has been great. Yeah. It's the first of many uh, little recordings we'll do here. And uh, yeah. we'll catch up soon. We'll catch up as soon as I get back from my retreat if I'm still here. Or if you still need me. Maybe you won't Sounds need me anymore. good, brother. So, yeah. <laughs> all right, guys. All right. So hey, everyone. It's Lee. Just one more thing before you go. If you've ever wondered if journaling could change your life, you can find out for free by downloading the Emotional Alchemy Journal from the link in the description. Also, if you're looking to connect with people who are just as passionate about growth as you are, check out our Facebook community. It's a great place to discuss what you've heard on the podcast and get access to exclusive content and sessions that are only available there. Just search for Human Evolution Movement on Facebook, or you can find the link in the description. Until next time, keep challenging the chaos within, be a little kinder to yourself, and let's continue to evolve together.